I left my husband and he was beating me every day. Three years ago, he tried to kill me. He beat me with a brick and they finally said, you gotta go. We decided that each month, the eight guys in our group would make a financial contribution. We would pool that money together and it rotates each month, but one of the guys in our group is then responsible for giving that money away. So after a year, I finally got the apartment. Small, but whatever. Hey, hey if it's a rough overhead, boys sleep wherever. <laughs> and uh, we finally got my family back together. We're not like living the finer things in life, but you know, they have clothes on their backs, food on the table. I need to start doing something for me because their lives are changing, but I'm still, even without him, you know, we've been separated at that point two years. I'm still stuck in the past. I decided to go to the dentist and I was like, help me. Like, I want to feel pretty again. But because of finances, I had to do it every week for four months. But it got to the point where I couldn't do it. So I went to the Salvation Army. This is where it all started. And they had no funds. So they sent me to you guys, to the church. I called Erin and I talked to her over the phone and she's like, come in, fill out an application. She was so sweet. And I came in that day. It was my month um, and I believe it was in October to decide what to do with, with our monthly gift. And I reached out to Erin Wise and she replied back and said, oh my gosh, I'm crying. Um, she said, I, I know exactly who this, who, who this should go for. And I had $500 to my name. My rent was 1000 I had utilities due. I, I didn't know what to do. And she looked right at me. And after the tears and the crying and everything went through, um, she's like, you keep that money. She's like, we're going to pay your rent. She's like, but make one promise. And I said, well, what's that? She's like, don't finish your teeth. And just in meeting Tanya, um, her strength is incredible. I don't know how she handles what gets put in front of her. That is just such an inspiration to me. And that, to me, is how the blessing kind of gets reciprocated. For me, just in my own personal journey, I just have a real heart for women like Tanya. So it's just, I mean, I think it's what God calls us to do. I mean, we're blessed. It's like a playground for us, to, for God to put all these people in our path. It is, it's just, it's incredible. It's, it's true joy. And we're just, you know, having the time of our lives, like giving money away. They took me shopping in this like storage room and they gave me blankets and pillows and it was overwhelming. Like I was speechless. The lady's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know what to say right now. The first time in my life I was ever speechless because I was like, this is all too much. It's just something about it. When I walked in the door, it was just like, God was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of you. And sure enough, it was like, I, you know, he paid two months of my rent. He made Christmas happen. He got my teeth fixed. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it all happened. And I just, I, I can't thank him enough for making me happy again, because that's what it took. If it wasn't for Chapel City Church, I don't know where me and my kids would be right now. I don't even know if we would be even in the apartment at this point. And I'm blessed every day that God got, you know, spoke to people and said, hey, help this family because I don't know how much longer I could have hung on. And I'm glad that I don't have to really, you know, I'm still stressing. I still, you know, I still got financials, it's whatever. But I know that people are here to help and people can help. And I'm hoping that, you know, at the end of all this too, that other people that need help, just ask. It's all you have to do is, you know, ask.
I love that story. It's very dear to my heart because it's dear to the heart of God. Uh, and I hope that you love it as well. I hope you caught some of that. Tanya doesn't know God and didn't know our church at all, but looking for help because her husband beat her with a brick and knocked her teeth out. And unbeknownst to us, God is bringing her while at the same time stirring the hearts of people in community, in a small group, who want to take seriously the call to love God and love people. And he brings these two things together for his glory and to bless both. And it's just so beautiful. I want to say a greeting again to all of you, especially those who are joining us at our Kesslinger campus and our Mill Creek campus. We're glad that you're with us this morning. And that story is the heart of what the church is supposed to be, which is precisely what we want to talk about this morning, what the church is and what it means to be part of it. So let's bow and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for that story, which is really your story. You're all over that story. Thank you that you're moving in our hearts in profound ways. Help us to pay attention this morning, and as we live our lives for your glory. Open your word to us, speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, uh, that, that story gets at the heart of the church, which is what we want to talk about. One year ago, I stood right here with a whiteboard and a marker, and we called it Vision Weekend, and I talked to you about what it meant to be a church that was not just in a particular neighborhood, but a church for the neighborhood in which it lived and existed. What it would be like to be a family of neighborhood churches. Uh, maybe you, perhaps you remember that. And I talked about what it meant to be a 1% church. Now, maybe you had, didn't hear that or have forgotten what that meant, means. 1% means this. Most of the churches in America are, in, are flat or in decline, over 80%. Of those that are growing, only about 1% are growing because they're reaching predominantly new people, unconnected people who are far from God. Meaning most of the churches that are growing are growing because dissatisfied churchgoers just decide, I'm going to go over there because this guy's annoying and the music's too loud and that guy doesn't wear a tie or whatever, you know. And they just, we just shuffle the Christian deck around. But only a small fraction of the churches in America are growing because they're reaching people who are far from God. So what would it look like for us to be that kind of church that was intentionally in a neighborhood, in a community, caring about that community and reaching people who were far from God? Now, you might hear some things that will be familiar to you, which is okay, because I think that vision leaks and we drift as people. We, do, we drift personally. I'm guessing this happens in your own life. We drift off course from what, who we should be as husbands and wives and fathers and sons and daughters. We also drift collectively as a church, and so it's good. We all need course corrections now and then. So you might think of this as a kind of a, a re-aiming us as a church on who we're supposed to be and what we're about. Uh, in fact, let's ask the question, what is the church? What is the church? Is the church a building? Is the church a collection of philosophical beliefs that you have to subscribe to? Is the church uh, a religious institution? What, what is, uh, a set of programs. What really is the church? What does it mean to be part of it? The church, we hear so much today about the, the decline of the church in America, the loss of its influence in culture. And in fact, Pew Research tells us that every year in our country, 4,000 churches close their doors for good, and only about 1,500 begin. So there's a net loss every year. But the church is more than the building that may or may not close. The church is not a set of philosophical beliefs. The church is not a political affiliation. The church is not a family tradition. It's not nice people dressing well, saying nice things to each other once a week for an hour. The church is all of the followers of Jesus everywhere. You might think of this as the church, capital C. The church in the world defies a building or a location or a place. It's all of the followers of Jesus everywhere. Everyone who he's called to himself who follows him. That is the church of which we are a part. So you can attend a building without being part of the church, if that makes any sense. Now there's two Greek words that in, used in the New Testament that help us understand what, what is meant by the church. Because I think we get fuzzy on this. The first word is the word translated church most often. It's the word ekklesia. It's a compound Greek word. I gotta be careful that I don't spell it wrong. Ek is the word for out in Greek. Klesia comes from the root word kaleo, which means to call. So literally, the church are, is the called out ones. We are called out of something, out of the world, out of darkness into light, the New Testament repeatedly says. We are called. And so you might think of the church as a collection of people
who are called out by God's grace. I don't know if you keep your collections in a box, but we do this morning. That's horrible perspective. There we go. So there's broken people. There's lost people. There's different races and genders and and, and socioeconomic backgrounds. There's hopeful people. There's all kinds of people in this collection that God has called, called the church. In fact, the church is not homogenous. It was never intended to be. It's to defy socioeconomic, racial, gender, uh, all kinds of uh, class lines. As a matter of fact, I, I, a, a friend of mine years ago who used to, has moved away now but used to attend our church and went to team Friday morning men's ministry. He's a blue-collar guy, been through a 12-step program, recovered from addiction, uh, not college educated, uh, and he sat at a table for years with all white-collar uh, yuppie types who were, worked in the, in the you know, in the business sector. And he said to me one time, I wouldn't even give these guys the time of day, let alone like them. But now I love them because of Jesus. The point is, the church is a collection of people God has called out to himself who without him, without Christ, would otherwise not have much to do with each other. Because he transcends all of the things that would culturally otherwise divide us. That's the church, capital C, the church in the world. That's how it's intended to be anyway. Now, in our culture today, you hear the phrase evangelical, and it's not used as a compliment. In fact, when people ask me what I do, and I get to tell them, there's always this pause, and I sort of enjoy this in a strange way. I'm about to tell them that I'm a pastor, and I watch their reaction. Some people visibly back up, actually, when I say that. Others, I can see the wheels turning, going, have I said anything offensive to him in the last four (laughs) minutes, you know? And when they ask what kind of church it is, and I remember one time a man said to me, oh, Are you an evangelical Christian? And I could tell what he meant by that. He meant something ugly and partisan and political because that's how he's heard it in our culture. But I actually think that that, what's happening in our culture right now, where there's this division and there's this doubt about the institutional church and, and the loss of what we might call cultural Christianity, is not a bad thing. Do you know what I mean by cultural Christianity? You're, you're, you go to church because it's what you do in your family. I grew up this way. It's part of our culture. I haven't really responded to the call of God on my life. I haven't surrendered to Christ. I just go to church a couple times a month and feel spiritually good about myself. I think that is dying in America, and that's a good thing. Because people are rejecting Jesus and the church because of a false idea about his message and his people. What an opportunity we have as the called out ones to give the world a different picture of what he's like, what his message really is, how his people are to live in the world. I think there's a purification going on, a refining going on, and there's an opportunity for us like maybe we haven't seen before. Because you see, the church is not intended as like um, an escape method. Sometimes I think people view the church or have historically viewed the church as like it's a, um, you know, the church is the way that you sort of hang on till heaven and avoid the evil corruption of the world. Sometimes a friend of mine says, too many Christians, evangelical Christians, view the Christian life like using a public restroom at a gas station. Let me explain what I mean by that. We go in and do what we have to do as fast as possible, touch as little as possible, and get out as soon as possible, right? So maybe there's this view of the world, that the world is evil, and the church is sort of some sort of like method to escape from the evil world when it all ends, right? So the, <laughs> the church is not an escape method from the world, never intended to be that. It's not a way out of the, you know, it's not that we are to view the world as corrupt, the world is bad, the church is good, let's protect our own, let's huddle up and hang on, and someday we'll be taken out of this mess. That's not in the scriptures. That's not in the Bible. That's not what Jesus intends. Which brings us to the next Greek word I want to tell you about that explains what the church is. It's the word apostello. It means to be sent. The Latin word for this is missio. We get our word missionary or mission from that. It literally means those who are sent. So the church is those who are called out and those who are sent to. Sounds confusing, right? 
We're called out, but we're also sent to. We are the called out ones. We are also to be the sent ones, and we'll explain that as we go. It's made up of those people who are called out of the world by the grace of God to surrender their lives to Christ, and then they're sent back to that world to be ambassadors of his grace. So the church is not an escape method. The church is, maybe you might think of it this way, is the kingdom of God. We pray this in the Lord's Prayer, right? Lord, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are moving in, as it were, kingdom movers. And I practice having enough room for this. I'm getting nervous that I have not done this well. We're kingdom movers. We're moving the kingdom of God into, to use our language, the neighborhood. Should we draw a nice little neighborhood down here? We move into the neighborhood, the kingdom of God. The church is supposed to be the presence of God in the world. How does the world know what God's kingdom is like? How would the world know what his followers are like? That's the church's job, to make that known by our words and our lives. So the kingdom of God is moving into the neighborhood. We need one more house in the neighborhood, don't we? Those houses are built crookedly, but you get the idea. The kingdom of God is moving in to the neighborhood. But meaning, and how does that happen? By the people of God. Those who are called out and those who are sent to are to be a picture to the world of what God is like and what his kingdom is like. That's why that story stirs my heart so much. It's kingdom of God stuff. It's how the church is supposed to be. People taking seriously. Did you hear what Don said? We, well, what does it look like for us to follow Jesus, to be serious about this call in our lives? Well, we have resources the rest of the world doesn't. What if once a month we pooled it and just trusted God with that? What could he do? Look what he did. They didn't know Tanya. I didn't know Tanya, but God did. God did. That's what it, the church is to be, moving into the neighborhood, making a difference. Now, this concept of being called out and sent to is all over the New Testament. But I just want to take you to one passage where we'll sort of camp out uh, to unpack it. It's in the book of First Peter. You can turn there if you like, or follow on the screen. First Peter chapter two, verses three through twelve. Let me read this passage, and then we'll we'll look at it together. First Peter two, verse three. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out, that's that word, ecclesia, of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now there's a whole lot in this passage. It's talking about the church. The whole passage is about the church. The, cent the center of it really is verse 9. Let me read that again. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's sort of the fulcrum, if you will, of this passage, the center of it. And it's powerful. So many rich and beautiful images in here about what the church is. But now, so when you hear this, him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who you are. That's very different, isn't it, than deciding to show up to worship once a week or twice a month or twice a year. When you think about what the church is, you who were called out of darkness into his marvelous light by the grace of God, chosen 
a people for his own possession, sent into the world on his behalf, that's not the same thing as which church should we attend? Which service do we like? You see the difference? All the difference in the world. And we need to get this right if we're to be the people he's called us to be. Now, this passage begins, uh, I, want, I want you to look, look back at verses 3 and 4, how it begins. The passage we just read. He says in verse 3, If indeed you have tasted of the Lord, it's good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. These two phrases, tasted and seen, and as you come to him. What is he talking about here? This is what we like to refer to around here as experiencing grace. Experience grace. Taste and see the Lord is good. Come to him. Experience grace. The church is made up of people who are called. And that call is a call of grace. You don't choose him. He chooses you. He calls you. And it's a call of grace. It me- what it means is you recognize that you don't have to measure up. You don't have to get your life together. You don't have to be good enough. I remember talking to a man at the fitness center years ago who said to me, I'd like to come to your church, but I need to get some things in order first. That's like saying, I'll come to the gym once I get myself in shape. I've tried that. It doesn't work that well. <laughs> you, a call of grace says, I know you've got broken parts of your life. I know there's shame. I know you feel like there's parts that, that you don't want anyone else to know about. I know that, there's a, that you're a mess. I know all of that. I'm calling you anyway because I love you. It's a call of grace. If you've tasted and seen that he's good, as you come to him, that's the entry point. That's the call. It's not obligation. It's not duty. It's not I have to do this to earn my way. It's a call of grace. This is what we share, the experience of grace. This is what transcends all the things that culturally would otherwise divide us. And this is why, if you think about it, all of our ministries and our programs around here at Chapel Street Church, if you really strip it down, what we're really trying to do in everything that we do is find more ways for more people to come to Jesus so that he can do what only he can do. I can't do that. You can't do that. What we saw in the video was God's hand, the work of Christ. Nobody can manufacture that. So we want in our efforts with our budgets and our staff and our programs to find more opportunities for more people to experience his grace, to come near to him so that he can do what only he can do. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. Now next, look at what Peter says happens to this collection of people who have experienced the grace of Jesus. Verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You yourselves are being built up together as a spiritual house. He uses this imagery of stones, living stones, repeatedly in this text. And this, by the way, is an image that's going to show up in the book of Ephesians when we study it beginning next week, so you kind of have a leg up already on the new series. He says, we are living stones built together into a spiritual house. This is temple language, meaning we're we're being joined together, built together, interconnected, interdependent, into a dwelling in which God intends to come and live by his spirit. Living stones, what does that mean? There's an interconnection and an interdependence in the church. It's not, a, it's not an, uh, something we do in isolation from each other. Not something that you do on your own terms and on your own time. Stones connected in a building are interlocked, interdependent. You pull enough of them out, and those above and those below begin to get weak and crumble. Is there an interdependence and interconnection in your life with other believers? To be honest, most of us don't think of the church as something we deeply depend on or rely on. Something we do on occasion. To the degree that we, you and I and all of us across all of our campuses are being built together, interconnected, depending on each other and on Christ. To that degree, God dwells in us and does amazing things in our midst. 
The New Testament knows nothing of solitary Christianity, independent Christianity. There's no such thing as a, a private Christian or a solitary one. This is how the reality of God comes into your life. And this is how you experience his power. If you want to know who God is and experience him in your life, and you want the, more of the reality of his kingdom in your life, it does not happen just you on your own with your Bible and your quiet time. I mean, you should be having that. You should read your Bible. But it's not enough, not nearly enough. You cannot expect God to be working in you, shaping you, changing you, and revealing himself to you if you're not connected with other believers. We call this growing in faith. It's not solitary. It's not private. Genuine spiritual growth does not happen in isolation. So are you so built into the lives of other believers, and they so built into your life, that if you were to stop showing up, you would feel like your life might start to crumble, and so would theirs? Or is it, nah, I'm not sure anybody would notice. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure I would miss it. Why is this the case? Why is it so? Nobody in, outside the scriptures put this better for one of the reasons why than C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves. You shouldn't laugh. It's, he's a great author. You should all read that. And, anyway, <laughs> The Four Loves. When, when Lewis describes friendship in The Four Loves, the four human experiences of love, phileo love, friendship love, he talks about two of his friends, Charles and Ronald. Ronald was the name for John Ronald Ruel Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien. Charles was Charles Williams. They're part of the Inklings, this, this literary club at Oxford. Two of his dearest friends. Charles dies. And Lewis says, I not only lost Charles, but I lost that part of Ronald that only Charles could bring out. So instead of having more of Ronald to myself now, not having to share with Charles, I actually have less of him. Because I lost that uniquely Charles part of Ronald. Do you understand what he's saying? How many of you had a friend and you thought you knew them and then you saw them with their brother or sister for the first time or at their workplace or in a family or in some other setting and you found out something about them you had no idea and like, whoa, I didn't even know that about you. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me many times. Meaning we know people not in isolation but in community. You can't even know a human being without knowing them in relational context. How could you possibly think you're going to know God on your own? It can't happen. You'll never know him unless you know him in community. It takes a community to reveal him. And so 81% of, Christ, of churchgoers in America, or I shouldn't even say churchgoers, 81% of people in America, according to Pew Research, tell us that they believe it's possible to have a perfectly flourishing Christian life without being connected to any church at all. All I can tell you is that notion comes up comes from an idea that you made up out of your head about God. Because that is not the God of the Bible. It doesn't work that way. I'm not saying God can't speak to you individually. I'm saying if you want to know him, experience his power, and grow into the man or woman he made you to be, that happens in as you are being built together into a spiritual house in which he will dwell. That's precisely by, why, by the way, groups matter so much to us around here. Why we talk about them all the time. Read the Bible in community. Get in community. Pray with each other. Be in groups. If you're not in a group, we do almost everything we do in, around here in groups. All right, so a little review. What's the church? The collective body of all the believers everywhere who have been called out by his grace and committed to following Jesus. And who are missio, right? Apostello, sent into the world. Why do we need the church? Because we're not going to know God or become the people we, he made us to be on our own. We need each other. We need that collection. But what's the role of the church in the world? Is the church good for the world? Now, sociologists and historians have told us that religions, almost all religious groups, tend to relate to the culture around them in one of two general ways. On the one hand, there are those that are separatists. We reject largely the culture in which we exist. We think it's immoral and corrupt. There's a high bar to get in. We're very exclusive. High doctrinal standards, high moral standards. The world is bad. We are good. Us against them, and we're separated. You know, you're rejecting culture. Makes sense? You've seen this. On the other hand, there are those that would be accepting of culture. There's no us and them. There's just us. Low bar, very few distinctions. 
We're uh, open and inclusive. Everyone's welcome. And we don't look much different at all from the culture other than perhaps the title on the door. You might think of this as a continuum, right? The, ex- the accepting of culture and the rejecting of culture. And churches have fallen somewhere on this continuum historically and so have other religious groups. But what does the scripture say? What does this passage say about how the church is to be in the world? It's to be neither fully assimilated nor fully separate. Neither fully accepting nor fully rejecting. Let me read to you from 2 Peter 2, or 1 Peter 2, excuse me, 11 and 12. These last two verses we read. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is an amazing couple of verses here. What Peter is saying is this. We are neither one of these places, separated rejecting and huddled up away from culture. Nor are we so assimilated that we're not distinct from culture. We're radically both in different ways. You know, in verse 11, there's the phrase, you as sojourners and exiles. Did you see that? Sojourners and exiles. Those are, that's, those are the Greek words for foreigners and aliens. What does that mean? Now, Peter is writing this to Christians Living in the Greco-Roman world, Greek-speaking Christians who are, they haven't moved to a different country. They're not like picking up, rooting, going somewhere else. They've just come to Jesus. What is he saying? It reminds me of a story a woman told me who came to Christ in our church. She came from a very liberal, progressive background where most of her family were agnostic and many atheist. And she came to faith in Christ. And at first she said, I don't know how to talk to them. I'm not sure I can talk about my faith. And then she did begin to share about her faith. And she said to me, I feel like a foreigner in my own family. And she said, I I haven't stopped loving them. I love them more and better than I ever have. But I feel like I don't fit like I used to fit. That's what Peter's saying. You come to Jesus Christ, you instantly become somewhat of an alien, a soldier, an exile, even in, you could live on the same street, in the same house, in the same neighborhood, in the same city, all your life. But when you are called out by his grace, you become a foreigner, an alien in some ways to that culture. Because your heart's changed, you're different. So when he says, you who are sojourners and exiles, what, they haven't moved? He's saying, spiritually speaking, you're strange, you're weird in that culture. This was certainly true of the early Christians in the Roman Empire. The early church in, in, around the Mediterranean world, the Roman Empire, was radically weird to that culture. Let me give you a few examples. They refused to put, go to the blood sport gladiatorial games, so they were viewed as antisocial. They refused, many of them refused, to serve in Caesar's bloody wars of conquest, so they were viewed as unpatriotic. They uh, were radically for the poor, Radically for orphans, radically pro-women, liberating and empowering to women in a patriarchal society. What does all that sound like? Against imperial impression, for the poor, for the orphans, for the widows, pro-women, open to all races and classes. What does that sound like? Classic liberalism. Okay, that was certainly true of them. They were also radically committed to one man, one woman for life as marriage. Radically against sexual immorality of all kinds, including homosexuality. They were radically against infanticide and abortion. Infanticide was more common in that culture because if you had a child that was born and was defective or if it was a girl, you didn't want a girl, you could leave it out in the elements and it would die of exposure. That was a common practice among the elites in the Greco-Roman world. They were radically against that. They would find these children and adopt them. And they were radically committed to the idea that Jesus was the only way to salvation. What does that sound like? classical conservatism. Even in the first century, Christ followers, the church, defied cultural categorization. And it should still be true of us today. What I see happening is we're selling out on one side or the other. We feel like, well, I've got to give up on that to be over here, or vice versa. We're supposed to be different, radically committed to the gospel call, which is going to mean things on both sides and some on neither side 
We are to defy categorization. Foreigners, aliens, sojourners, exiles. We don't fit that way. Look at verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That is a weird sentence. Did you hear that? Keep your conduct among the Gentiles. Gentiles means everybody else, the world, in other words, who aren't believers. Keep your conduct among those who don't believe what you believe, such that even though they'll talk about you as evildoers, they're also going to praise God. What? Think about that for a minute. They're going to speak about you as evildoers. Isn't that happening in the culture today? Organized religion's bad for the world. Christianity in moderation is fine, but too many Christians are, it's bad for society. They're going to speak about you as evildoers, yet at the same time, they'll see something about you and praise and eventually give glory to God. You will have, in other words, both reactions of rejecting and curiosity and accepting and praising God. It has always been, it will always be. If we measure relevance and impact in the world based on how many people like you or don't question you or believe what you believe, that's not it. Live lives, such lives in the world among those people who don't believe what you believe and think you're weird that even though they may at times say things that are hurtful, they will also see your life and praise God. That's, that's what it means to love your neighbor. So verse 11 and verse 12, different but close enough to make a difference. This is what we mean when we say make an impact around here. You can't Love your neighbor from a distance. If you're a separatist, hived off with only other believers, huddled up trying not to get corrupt by the world, you can't love your neighbor because you won't know them. You won't be close enough to them. Neither can you make a difference in your neighbor's life if you are no different from them. The church means what we're called to be is different enough from the culture and close enough to the culture to make an impact for Christ. That is a hard line to walk, isn't it? That's a hard balance. That's our vision as a church. That's who we want to be. People radically committed to the gospel call, to the truth of God's word, who take a stand for what God takes a stand for, who unashamedly hold up the values of scripture, and so on that note are different from the culture in many ways. And yet, we're in it. We're in the world. We're close enough to people to love them, to reach them, to serve them. Where do we find the the motivation and courage and power to live this way. It, it, it comes to us, and in fact, in your sermon notes, you'll see at the bottom there uh, re- the reference to verses 6 and 7 and a little stone drawn there. Over and over again in this passage, we're, we hear about the cornerstone. Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. That's the question. It, what, what, P, what Peter's saying here is this. The church is built on a particular foundation, a cornerstone. We sang that song, the church is one foundation, as we started. That was not unintentional, by the way. But so is your life. Every person is building their life on something. On something you think is solid enough to last. On something you think is firm enough to hold you up. On something that's, that, that you can count on, that won't crumble. People, and many of you are, are, are here doing this. You can be attending a church building all your life and not have Christ as your cornerstone. You could be building your life on your career. That can crumble. Be building it on your children's success and health. Many of you know that can crumble. You can build it on a particular relationship. That certainly can crumble. You can build it on your reputation and your personal achievements. I can't rely on anything else. I'll do it myself. That crumbles. We fail. The message Peter's saying here is the only thing that's strong enough, firm enough, that will never crumble is Jesus Christ. When I hear this phrase, cornerstone, I think of the stones that when I had a chance to visit Israel in Herod's temple. Maybe you, perhaps you've heard about this or seen this. You'll see an image here of the cornerstone. This is the largest of the Herodian stones. It's 40 feet long and about uh, 12 and a half feet high. It weighs 500 metric tons. By the way, the largest cranes we have right now can only lift 300 metric tons. Did you hear that? It's 200 tons larger than the most powerful crane we have today. How do they move that thing in the first century? 
And when the Romans came in 70 AD and destroyed the temple and threw it all down, there's chisel marks in this stone and stones like it, the Herodian stones, the cornerstones of the Temple Mount, that they couldn't throw down. So they just said, well, that's enough. We'll leave this one. It's still there. The seams on this stone and the other stones that are like it, are, th- th- you can put a piece of paper in between them. They're perfect. It hasn't moved in all these centuries. That's what Peter's saying to us here. Build your life on that which will, is rock solid and will not move is unshakable. The culture's shifting sand. It's changing faster than most of us can keep up with it. Everything else crumbles. Only Christ holds and is firm enough to build your life on. So you personally build your life on Jesus as your cornerstone. And us collectively as a church, he's our cornerstone. He has been and will continue to be. That's where we find the strength and the courage and the power to live this way as sojourners and exiles, but also present in the world as called out but sent to if christ isn't your cornerstone you're going to fall off that ledge on one side or the other aren't you but if he is so you want to know okay what's the vision that's it that's the vision it's not new it's not different it's it's bringing us back into focus and saying god's called us out by his grace and he sent us into the world as his ambassadors and we can only live that way if we're being built together on the foundation of who Jesus Christ is. It's the church. That's my heart for my life, my family, for you and your family, and for us as it is the church family. And so we want to finish by coming to him. Notice that phrase? As you come to him. We're going to come to him at his table. It's the perfect way to finish. Coming to the table of the one who is our rock and our cornerstone. And celebrate communion as we worship him, Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. Let's bow together in prayer. Father God, we acknowledge that you are high and lifted up. You are sovereign Lord of all creation. And you, in your mercy and grace, have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. You redeemed our lives. And you have sent us into the world to shine your light, to live out your gospel truth. We can only do this if we build our lives on you, Jesus, our cornerstone. So as we come now to your table to remember your sacrifice through bread and cup, I pray that you prepare our hearts, realign our lives to be built on you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen indeed. Kevin, you can fill this place. Uh, just a reminder, before the benediction and when you're dismissed, is that uh, this is the first of the month that we receive the benevolent offering as you leave. And if you came prepared to give to that, I want to remind you that those monies go to meet the needs of people like Tanya in our church and our community who are hurting and in need. So thank you again for your generosity. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the one who is your solid rock and your cornerstone. Build your life on him. Amen. And go in peace.